Uh, warmly welcome to this session, everyone. Uh, healthy rangelands for enhanced water security under a changing climate. My name is Malin Lundberg Ingemarsson. I'm a team lead water for the resilient landscapes uh, at Siwi, a Swedish water house. And uh, in this session, we will discuss innovative solutions linked to rangelands restoration uh, that jointly address the challenges of water insecurity, food insecurity, biodiversity loss, and climate change. And we are actually a big group of organizations behind this session, which makes it extra fun to present this to you. Uh, so we are uh, the Coalition of Action for Soil Health, uh, called CASH. Uh, we are C4 and ICRA. We are the Forest Climate and Livelihoods Research Network, FUKALI, which is a Swedish research network. Uh, it's uh, the Internet uh, Intergovernmental um, uh, Authority on Development, IGAD, and their Center for Pastoral Areas and Livestock Development. It's also the Swedish University of Agricultural Science, uh, the University of Nairobi, World Wildlife Life Fund, as well as us at uh, CUE, uh, Stockholm International Water Institute. And we actually uh, have just received a four-year research grant from FORMAS, which is uh, the Swedish Research Council for Sustainable Development, uh, which will be led by Aida barges Tobeya from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. Uh, you will meet her later in the panel. And this funding means actually that this webinar is kind of the starting point of the project that will link soil and water to building healthy and resilient rangelands through uh, restoration. So with that, let's get started. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome um, our keynote. Welcome Lee Winowecki, uh, Global Research Leader of Soil and Land Health at C4 ICRAF. Uh, you will talk about global, the global relevance of rangelands and the importance of assessing multiple dimensions of rangeland health. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. And as you can see, uh, these are the co-authors and the projects and organizations that are all instrumental in putting together these data sets and this presentation. So on the next slide, in case anyone dozes off or really just likes to have the key messages at the beginning, I'd like to sh share with you the key messages. So that's first around investment. So we have a key message around our need for increased investment in rangeland restoration, as well as rangeland health monitoring to fill key knowledge gaps and to prioritize and track interventions over time. Science. We have the tools and methods to track multiple indicators of rangeland health, coupling on the ground measurements with earth observation, Third is around innovation. The innovations around combining scientific research with citizen science to scale monitoring efforts while enhancing community engagement. And fourth, scaling, encouraging farmer and pastoral led innovations to make sure the practices are tailored to meet the needs. And the next two speakers will really ground us in some of those interventions. So on the next slide, I'm just highlighting that Grasslands, rangelands and savannas cover between 30 and 50% of the terrestrial biosphere. This is a photo I took in Lesotho. And you may be wondering, why is it between 30 and 50%? That's a huge variation. Well, it speaks to what I'll be talking about today, the need for enhanced um, investment in monitoring. On the next slide, I show you that we don't have to despair anymore because finally these rangeland systems are in the spotlight. We have the International Year of Rangeland and Pastoralists in 2026, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. I hope everyone saw the science special issue on grassy biomes. So really now is our opportunity to convince Vince, um, the community to come together around rangeland health. So the next slide talks about some recent studies on 
how critical grasslands are for biodiversity. So there was a recent study that looked at the different types of biodiversity and where those hotspots are from plants to mammals to birds. And really the final message is that there's underestimated biodiversity in these tropical grassy biomes. The next slide talks about how important grasslands are for storing carbon. So over one third of the global terrestrial carbon stocks are there. And I show this photo that I took um, of a soil profile to show you the depth of some of the grass roots. It can be four to five times deeper than what's above ground, providing an annual source of organic matter into the soil, making grassland soils, rangeland soils critically important for climate change mitigation and adaptation. On the next slide, I highlight a really fantastic study we did last year where we surveyed 6,000 publications and we looked on restoration. And guess what? 78% were on forests. Grasslands and drylands received less than 6%. And then when we start digging into Digging in deeper around some key areas that are needed around drylands and grasslands, you can see the uh, figure on the right, the arrows, the thick arrows are pointing straight toward scientific research. There is a huge gap in these biomes for scientific research. So that leads to the next slide, which is just this plea, this call to action for targeted investments in soil, water, and rangeland health address these gaps, and remember to reverse and prevent further degradation, contribute to climate change adaptation mitigation, SDGs, and ecosystem restoration targets. On the next slide, I'm focusing in now on data. What are the evidence gaps? And yes, the article in 2022 by Bunsian uh, et al. did highlight some grassy biomes in Africa, but then on the right, when we looked at the soil carbon studies, actually Africa was completely underrepresented. We had Asia, North America, and Europe. So this is a real opportunity. And what we've been doing at C4ECRAF on the next slide is using the land degradation surveillance framework. It's designed to provide a biophysical baseline and monitoring and evaluation framework. But I use this photo because this is the team in the field in the dry rangelands in northern Kenya. They're collecting multiple indicators across plots, across a landscape. On the next slide, I show that it's a wonderful uh, framework because the equipment photo on the left is simple and it's accessible, which means communities can access this and implement the method. Also, it measures multiple indicators at the same geo-reference location, and it's been implemented in over 40 countries. So the next slide just shows you, let's talk about some example outputs. I have three minutes. So the next slide is an example of a, a GCF project called Twende toward ending drought emergencies, where we put in three LDSF sites in Eastern and Northern Kenya. And there's bar charts of the three sites. You see in Birakani has the highest number of perennial grasses, the highest number of forbs, and the highest number of woody species compared to the others. So when you use a consistent methodology, you can compare across sites. Now get your eyes ready, because on the next slide it's glaring and there's a lot of data, but I wanna make this point. This is a frequency graph of grass species. So I showed you before the number of unique species of grasses, but now because we know we must understand which species there are. So even if you don't know grass species like me, because I am in love with grass species, so is Margaret, um, the middle graph, you can see that LDSF site has more species. You see the site on the right in Mid-Tana has less species. Then I started showing you photos of which species there are. So then we start doing functional traits and start understanding, okay, what is the functional diversity of these grasslands? And then for restoration, what do we need to do? So grass species diversity important. The next slide is about tree species. Each LDSF site uh, does a complete assessment of the tree species. So... There's a large number of tree species in this site, but guess what? The top two species are what? Acacia rufusians, which I put the photo here, and prosopis. One is an, both are invasive, one is indigenous, and one is exotic. So tree cover is not enough. We must understand which species. The next slide is what you must be wondering, where's the water? What's the water measurements? 
So at each site, we also look at infiltration rates, and this has been modeled by Ida, and this is how we are comparing box plots. So the wider the box plot, the higher the variation. So you can clearly see the lower site, Chaparraria, has the lowest a variation and the lowest water infiltration. Why does that matter? Because this is telling you how fast the soil can absorb water. So if it's raining faster than the soil can absorb, you have runoff, you have erosion. So it's critically important. And the next slide is, I hope I'm not jinxing us, but a paper we've submitted with positive feedback where we took over 2,000 3,000 measurements of infiltration across Sub-Saharan Africa, again, led by Ida, so all questions will go to her. And it turns out that there are a number of covariates that are important for predicting field-saturated hydraulic conductivity. And I can't have a presentation without highlighting what one of those variables are, soil organic carbon. So the next side, slide shows the auger that we collect the soil data with, the soil sample, and then a number of East African rangeland sites, topsoil, subsoil. Each bar box plot shows over 160 sample points. So the wider the box plot, the more variation. Turns out the highest carbon in top and sub is in the Mara and Lewa, big conservancy areas. And then you see some of the other sites like in Balambala having low carbon lysomus. This is what our next two speakers will speak to, how we can increase soil carbon, how interventions can improve soil health. So my last two slides, the next slide shows turning that data into maps because everybody loves maps. So this is a map of soil organic carbon. We have over 85% accuracy because we have this huge data set. So this is um, higher, darker carbon, darker colors, higher carbon for Lewa. And my next slide just goes, now we're really moving into assisted citizen science, combining this with the systematic field surveys, building capacity. And so by combining these innovations, we can understand drivers, but really track restoration in real time. And with that, I'm at my nine minutes. Thank you so much, Malin, and everyone for the opportunity. Thank you. My last slide. Fantastic. Thanks so very much, Lee. Uh, and a special thank you for the photo of the grass roots. I've worked a lot with links between freshwater and climate change mitigation. And it really, when the roots are that long, it really makes sense to also think about grasslands when it comes to, to, to mitigation. So, so that was an eye opener for me. Thank you. Okay, and uh, now we will have two case studies, as Lee have mentioned. Uh, first, I would like to welcome Margaret Niaga. Um, Margaret is a PhD student at the University of Nairobi, and she's involved in the Drylands Transform project. And today she will talk about building resilience, restoration of rangelands for enhanced water security in the drylands of East Africa. So welcome, Margaret. And we have a re recording of the presentation to be on the secure side since the, the uh, internet connection can fluctuate a little bit. But Margaret is with us. So for the panel later, she will be able to also answer your questions. Um, please go ahead. Evening, my name is Margaret Nyaga, a PhD student at the University of Nairobi, working with the Drylands Transform project. Uh, Drylands Transform is a research project in the drylands of East Africa, led by Swedish University of, of Agricultural Sciences in partnership with a multidisciplinary team of researchers. And the aim of the project is to investigate the link between land health, livestock-based livelihoods, human well-being, and land management and governance. Uh, as drylands transform, we are working in the Karamoja cluster in the cross-border area between Kenya and Uganda, and there are myriad of challenges that are faced in these ecosystems. One is land degradation. This is due to overgrazing, land use changes, and invasive species, uh, water scarcity and rainfall variability, and feed shortages. Uh, this is a, a drone picture of one of the livestock cafes in West Pokot County, Kenya, that was taken during the dry season, showing 10 months after implementation of restoration activities. Livestock cafes are knowledge sharing hubs and demonstration sites of different rangeland management and restoration options 
and value chain improvements and income generating activities such as grass seed and hay. And there are clear differences between the area within the livestock cafe and outside. And I'm going to show you some of the interventions uh, that have been implemented on the livestock cafes. These are some of the restoration interventions for soil and water conservation that have been implemented on the livestock cafes. One is water harvesting using the half moons. Since restoration of grasslands requires a comprehensive approach that addresses soil and water management to promote the health and resilience of ecosystems. Uh, the next intervention is using rock check dams. This is to encourage the local communities to use the range available materials in restoration efforts. Uh, the other one is use of vetiver grass, uh, which, is a, which is a low cost and eco-friendly tool to combat soil erosion and for water conservation. This is because it has abundant, complex, and extensive root system, and it plays a very vital role in watershed protection by slowing down uh, surface runoff and reducing siltation of drainage systems and water bodies. Uh, the other uh, intervention is receding using ridgeland grasses and legumes. The aim is to uh, provide high quality and quantity feed for the livestock throughout the year. And these feeds are, but this, um, the fodder production areas are managed through the cut and carry because the land is still in the early stages of restoration. And this, uh, with the, this receding work, is they are, uh, ensures that there is food security and it, it enhances the resilience of households and reduction of poverty. Uh, these are some of the results on, the, uh, on restoration and fonda production one year since the time um, the interventions uh, were implemented. And this picture, this is a drone picture and a picture from the ground showing the fence that is separating the degraded land and the land that is under restoration. Uh, for more information, you can follow us on, on our website and on Twitter. And uh, Dryland Transform Project is funded by farmers. Thank you. Evening. Thank you so very much, Margaret. Um, very interesting to see. I, I, I'm so impressed how fast uh, the restoration interventions give results. Uh, really, really nice to see. Okay, the second case study. Uh, now we welcome uh, Oben uh, Widrago from uh, Terra Vert, uh, which is a non-governmental organization in Burkina Faso. Uh, and uh, Oban will tell us about rational grazing and rainwater management in Burkina Faso. And this is also a recording, but, but Oban is, is with us and, and will be part of the panel later. And I haven't mentioned yet, but if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and we will try to address them uh, during the, the, the panel discussion later. Please, Oban. I'm Obin Widrago, and I work for the NGO Tervet in Burkina Faso. The NGO Tervet has been working in Burkina Faso since 1989 through, through local intervillages associations in the creation of bookage perimeters. A bookage perimeter is a new concept of rural development developed in the Palat farm of Gye, in the village of Gye, in, uh, in, uh, in the 90s, and now taking up to other Buki Bukinabis pilot farms, grow 14 villages. So, 
So I'm going to talk about what rainwater conservation and lapse of grazing in the bookage perimeter. A bookage, a bookage perimeter is an integrated system that combines trees, livestock, and crops. Its main objective is to fight land degradation through controlling livestock grazing and promoting agroecological best practices. Its first vocation is to keep water where it falls in order, in order to mitigate the erosive action of monsoons waters and also to maintain the biodiversity of the area. A bookage perimeter can be defined as a landscape of fields su surrounded by edge rows. This is a bookage perimeter of 100 hectares. It's subdivided into different fields. These are the fields. from which can benefit 23 families. Each family has access to six fields of 0 0.64 hectares. A field is limited by bands. This is, you can see in this picture, women digging a trench and at the same time making a band of the field. And also a living edge. This is the living edge. The living edge is multifunctional, uh, which can provide fodder, fruits, leaves, and firewood. It depends on each farmer's choice. Here we can have a mix. Here we have a mix of Cassia siberiana and and Cometum migrantum, which provides a firewood and medicines. In the middle of the field, you can see a line of trees, which are also multifunctional. It always depends on each farmer's choice. These trees can provide uh, fruits, firewood, fodder, and so on. At the lowest corner of the field, we dig a pond to collect surface runoff. This, but this water recharges the groundwater and and the surf at elf is increasing. And also uh, it allows naturally ground grass to get back. When it comes to grazing, each year, each year in the bookage perimeter, each farmer is advised to let one field lie fallow. The fallow field is subdivided into portions. A portion, we, we enclose a portion with an electric fence. This is the electric fence. And you can see lots of grazing in a portion of this field. In the bookage perimeter, lots of graze naturally growing grass in the rainy season and crops residues after harvest. In this picture, you can see lots of grazing crop residues after harvest in the portion of a, of a field. This portion is enclosed with an electric fence.
Thank you for the attention. If you want more information, you can contact me through this, and I will be happy to respond to you. Thank you. I'm Obin with Drago. Thanks so very, very much, Oban. Um, I would like now to uh, go into the panel discussion. So if you have any questions to any of our presenters, um, please uh, write them in the chat. Uh, and we also like to welcome a few other panelists, except from the, the ones who have presented today. So we have Dominic Gatia from, from EGAD. Are you with us, Dominic? Yes, uh, I'm right here. Thank you. Pleasure. Fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome. And we have Melissa D. Ho from, uh, uh, from World Wildlife Fund. Uh, the Freshwater and Food Division. Welcome, Elisa. Hello, thanks. And we have, as mentioned a few times already, Aida Vargas Tobeya, who is a researcher at uh, the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Welcome, Aida. Thanks. And we also have, of course, uh, Margaret, Oban, and Lee with us. So. Uh, please feel free to, to write questions uh, to, to any of them in, in the chat. Um, let's start off with a question to you, Melissa. What is the role of grasslands and rangelands in conservation of biodiversity and also in climate globally? Because uh, they are often overlooked, but why is that? And what is their role in, in climate mitigation and climate adaptation? P please elaborate a little bit. Yeah, thanks so much um, to you, Malin, and Ida, and Lee, and the organizers for putting this uh, really important session together in CWE uh, and World Water Week. It's not a topic you will hear here, and I think the connection between grasslands and land and uh, water resource management is so critical. So really appreciate this was the first ever grassland session at, at World Water Week. Um, so I, I want to just piggyback off of the really great remarks that Lee provided. I have three points to follow up on what she said, and, and that uh, grasslands have intrinsic value, um, nature and climate, as she noted, you know, it's, it's uh, biodiversity, and it's also climate mitigation and adaptation. I think something that she noted at the top is that we forget and don't realize that about half of our land mass is in grasslands. And this 2021 grasslands, the rangelands atlas that she noted, was really the first time we are putting grasslands on the map. And the range and diversity of these biomes that are called by different names around the world. And so um, I think that's one thing that uh, that we don't even realize the extent of these biomes. I think the second thing is, as she noted, you know, um, about a third of all carbon stocks are actually in grasslands. That root picture I love too, 70%, unlike forests, we know so much about forests and our appreciating them and we need to conserve our tropical and temperate rain uh, forests for sure. But grassland system, 70% of that carbon is below ground and it's hidden and not seen and we forget that. And so I think they are an important source of carbon. Um, and then this other piece around biodiversity, they um, are host to endemic species. They're not just degraded forests. They really, in their own right, think of the African savannas, think of the Cerrado in South America. 5% of all of global species are in the Brazilian Cerrado, which is the neighbor of the Amazon, which I totally appreciate, and, and we need to save the Amazon rainforest. But the Cerrado often is unknown or forgotten in, in, the, in the imaginations of, the, of, of an average person in the world. And then the last piece, 80% of our ag productive land is in grasslands and savanna system. 60% of the world's food is produced in these ecosystems. And so they're critical roles for pastoralist systems, for livelihoods, but for food security. So I think we forget that piece as well. Well. So there's a whole bunch of the last thing I'll mention, because this is a water conference, is that 
We forget about the role of grasslands in water filtration, water management, water storage, especially because many of them are in temperate or arid or semi-arid regions. And so we think of the fire systems we see around the world. We think of um, the risks um, and so adaptation and understanding climate resilience, especially for water resource management, um, is something that we we also forget about with grasslands. And my second and third points, and I know you want to go on to the others, um, and I we can come back to some examples, but I think the second point is that grassland ecosystems, because they are not remembered uh, for all the services they provide, are in need of protection and conservation. Um, they are not on the global and national climate and nature agendas. They are not on investment priorities. You do not see them talked about so much in the climate conversations and the Convention on Biological Diversity the way they should be. Um, and then you do not see investment as much. And I, I'd say the third thing is investment. And Lee noted so rightly about the need for just basic data to benchmark and manage and monitor. Um, but we also need investment for the people that live on these landscapes to continue to drive better regenerative practices, you know, uh, to in the face of climate change, especially um, these these stakeholders and these important biomes need support and investment um, for for future uh, conservation of grasslands as well. So definitely data and science, um, but also I'd say for the livelihood investments and conservation protection of grasslands, we need to get them on the radar. Thanks so much. Thanks so very much, Liz, uh, Melissa. I agree uh, totally. Uh, uh, and also on top of that, they, they need tools also to, to know how to work uh, with this. Um, uh, I want to direct the next question to Ida. Ida, uh, talking about tools and, and so what, what are some of the key aspects of water smart restoration when it comes to rangelands? Yes. Um... Yeah, thanks, Malin. So um, I think that maybe what's most important to highlight when we think about water is that water is both part of the challenge, right? And it's also part of the solution to this land degradation, uh, biodiversity loss and, and climate change crisis that, that many rangelands are facing. Um, we know that global warming is intensifying the, the global water cycle, right? We have like more a frequent and more intense uh, extreme precipitation. And we have seen this in Sweden this summer, for example, we, we don't need to go very far. Uh, and then we also know that erosion by water is one of the main uh, land degradation processes that we have. We have seen pictures that Margaret and Lee have shown how bad uh, erosion can be. Uh, and but but and, and that, is, that is part of the challenge. But then as, if we think about the solutions, if we think about climate change, mitigation, adaptation, we also know that water sustains life on earth right so so how do we how do we play with this dual uh, role of water and i think that the key right is to capture the water in the landscape uh, as margaret and obin and others have said how do we make this water stay in the landscape how do we make this water that uh, recharge the soil and the groundwater because this is this crucial to support like plant growth, it's crucial to support dry season flows, right? Um, and it's also crucial to reduce like the risk of erosion and the risk of water related disasters such as flooding or drought. Uh, so I think supporting practices that maintain uh, and restore uh, the soil hydro hydrological functioning and that reduce surface runoff uh, is critical. And we have seen some examples today uh, from Margaret and Obin, uh, like, like the half moons, right, that Margaret has shown from uh, West Pocot, or practices such as limiting uh, livestock stocking rates, uh, promoting vegetation cover uh, within the roots, <laughs> the, the, the pictures from the roots, and also like increasing soil organic carbon, as Lee was mentioning, it's also really, really important. Um, so I think, yeah, those are some of the practices I think we should have in mind. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Aida. Um, continuing on that, uh, from, from, um, from your perspective, Dominic, uh, what is the biggest barrier to upscaling rangelands restoration and also soil health in interventions in general in East Africa?
Did we lose you, Dominic? I think you, the picture froze, right? No, you're there, Dominic. Uh, question for you, Dominic. Um, what is the biggest barrier to upscaling rangelands restoration and also uh, soil health interventions in East Africa? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Malin. Uh, thank you for uh, moderating this uh, panel discussion. And it's uh, as well a pleasure uh, being uh, on board with the rest of the panelists, uh, the Melissa, Zaida, and the rest will come after me. And uh, also the listeners who are listening to us, it's a pleasure being with you. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to just give a little bit of uh, uh, the, the status of the rangelands in the Iga region. Uh, where we have rainy lands forming 60-70% of the total land area. And uh, these rainy lands host uh, about 60% of the livestock population, which is very important for the people living in the Igad region, being a, a pastoral dominated area. And you find that uh, these very rainy lands also go ahead to host ecosystem services. Here we are talking about the fauna, we are, that's, those are the animals, we are talking about the flora, the plants, we are talking about uh, soil being in this in, in play, when we are talking about ecosystem services, we are talking about the water, and you know, in all these ecosystem, we are talking about issues of the water cycle, the infiltration that our colleagues have just been uh, talking about, Uh, issues of evaporation and all this become paramount in hosting the ecosystems in these regions. So, which come in as the barriers? Uh, we are looking at issues of inadequate research of uh, extension and human resource capacity uh, to implement rangeland management programs. We have aspects of degradation, degradation where we are not looking at sustainable use and appropriate use uh, for uh, that, that can uh, enhance um, continuity. So we have uh, issues of climate change, frequent droughts being very key when we are talking about issues or barriers affecting the, the, the rangelands. And we, find we are again having a multiplier effect in the in the food in the feed supply and quality in within the region uh, because of these impacts that the regulars are faced with. Therefore, this reduced feed supply and quality at the end of the day also results into impacting on the livestock production, productivity, and even trade. among other issues. That is becoming a matter like this. We have countries in within the region. We find that the responsibilities are supposed to be shared among these countries. And therefore, at the end of the day, this does not become a single country's responsibility. And therefore, it is some of these issues, because of their interconnectedness and the shared responsibilities, calls on regional actions and at the regional action we find egan coming into play to think of, of how they can manage these aspects and that led to a development of a, a, a regional rangeland uh, management strategic framework which began to be developed in 2019 as we speak it's in existence with an overall objective of achieving sustainable rangeland management in the Higa region by addressing the challenges that we have just highlighted that are facing the rangelands through harmonizing policies and practices among the member states. And as a, a way of complementing on the efforts which we cannot say don't exist, but existing in the Higa member states uh, in sustainable rangeland management. So basically, the, 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 the regional approach comes in to complement on what 
the, the, the member states are already under coming up with the regional ready land management strategic framework. Thank you, and which are guiding. So basically, one uh, is in place to address those issues. Thank you. Back to you, Malim. Thank you so much, Dominic, uh, especially for highlighting how important it is to think in the bigger picture in the whole region that this is cross border. So we need to work together to address these challenges. Okay, we have uh, some questions in the chat uh, for uh, Margaret and Oban. Um, could you please comment on whether it has been possible to integrate or build on traditional practices in the livestock cafes or in the bocage uh, parameters? Uh, and how has that been? Is, has it been tricky or easy or so? Uh, so I hand over first to Margaret. Uh, thank you, Malin, and for the question from the participant. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, the activities that have been carried out, uh, for example, in the livestock cafes, um, the traditional practices of the people have been incorporated in such a way that uh, we, because uh, the aim of the livestock cafe, uh, we are including the views of the local communities uh, to co-generate and uh, to co-create and uh, generate knowledge uh, with the people. So um, we are working with the communities, not working for the community. So their views are welcome um, in the discussion about the, the different um, maybe restoration efforts that they think can work. And this is complemented by the scientific knowledge of the researchers. So it has been easy to work with the communities and when you incorporate the traditional ecolog ecological knowledge of the people, uh, this fosters a sense of ownership that the activities that are being carried out, they are also benefiting from it, not only uh, about the, uh, the, health, uh, the health of the residents, but also the communities are benefiting. And they have a sense of ownership that this work is for, for our benefit, not just for the project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Margaret. Uh, Oban, the same question to you. Uh, do you experience the same uh, things when it comes to uh, to integrate traditional practices uh, in your work? Okay, but thank you for the floor. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, as I said before, in the book experiment, uh, we have integrated uh, some traditional book practices. Uh, it's like uh, they pits, so in order to collect both surface both runoff, we also uh, help farmers to uh, you know to uh, to plant trees or you know or to uh, you know but to plant trees and to uh, or can I, uh, to plant trees and to. And to breed, mm -hmm. so, so that's what I can say about integrating some traditional practices. You know, uh, in the book experiment, we 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 help them to, as I said, we help them to to do the pits uh, that are a square shape, uh, and also to uh, uh, to to breed uh, to breed uh, animals. Thank you, Oben. Thank you. Uh, another question for the both of you. Uh, Sarah from FAO uh, th is uh, thanking for the great examples you provided. And she wonders if it's still part of a funding or a project cycle. And if so, what is the strategy for ensuring the implementation of these measures in the future? Oben, 
how okay. is it with your project? Yes, a book age of perimeter is a you know is a part of a funding project. Uh, we uh, we help, uh, you know uh, before we we were focusing on on the implementation of the book age perimeter, uh, but uh, now we uh, have received an an international training. Uh, given by the Stockholm International Water Institute and the Swedish Forest Agency uh, in, uh, in you know in developing a business a businesses for small orders mm -hmm. we, we we realized that uh small uh, you know small farmers are very interested in developing small businesses and so we think that uh when these you know when the businesses are developed they will get do a lot of money and then they will help others you know and then they will help other farmers to to implement the bookage perimeter so we think that in, in the future uh, uh, the beneficiary farmers can help others uh, to implement uh, the bookage perimeter mm -hmm. thank you Robin. thank you uh how is it for, for your project, Margaret? Margaret? Yeah, uh, is, uh, is, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, part of the Dwellers Transform project is to uh, transform uh, land, landscape, livestock, and livelihood. And that's why we, we have set up uh, like a demonstration site to showcase some of the different uh, um, management options for the rangelands, and so some of these activities or the activities are um, are funded. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I have a question who isn't directed to anyone here. So, so let's see who of you would like to answer. Uh, it's about water retention and inf infiltration. Uh, often land restoration and water retention or infiltration measures are started with earth works such as trenches or crescents, which are quite labor intensive. Do you see opportunities to start these processes with other less labor intensive measures? Do you know of any less labor intensive measures for retention and infiltration? I open the floor. Uh, Ida? Yeah, maybe I can say something. Yeah, it's... exactly. So so we have like these labor intense like structures, water harvesting structures, right? But then I think also there are practices like controlling livestock grazing or promoting, right, like agroecological practices in soils to enhance uh, organic carbon uh, and so on that can be like extended over large areas, right? And that are not labor intensive. And still we know that this has an effect on the infiltration capacity of soils, that we can improve infiltration capacity over large areas if, if we have this, these practices. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, of course it depends on what's the starting point, right? <laughs> Is it like mm. extremely degraded and like, you have galley erosion and so on, you need to start, uh, yeah, you need to have like structures like the ones that Margaret has shown. Uh, so, so it, yeah, it depends a little bit, but I think we also need to think not just about the structures, but also about increasing like the hydrological functioning of soils over broader areas, yeah. May I just add, I couldn't agree Please. more with Ida. Um, my my only comment is that I think there's also an there's not a silver bullet of technologies on a landscape. And you also another key variable, you really need to think about what the precipitation and rainfall amount is. Uh, and that if you are really in an arid or semi-arid region and you must capture water to even get vegetation started, I think that is where you see a lot of these earthen works 
um, uh, investments needed um, because water is so scarce. Um, but in other places where you want to prevent degradation and more desertification and aridification, and, and I, I couldn't agree more with Ida, better vegetation and animal and livestock system management is the best place to start just to keep the water and, and rainfall on the landscape through natural infiltration. Um, that That's the best means to start. But I think it just it also really depends on the context of your landscape um, as well. And, and as Ida mentioned, the starting point of, of what what the health and status is in addition to the overall rainfall amount. Mm, true. Thanks so much, Melissa. Maybe Marlene, if I could comment on that. Please, uh, please go ahead. Yes, I concur with the words of Melissa and uh, Ida that it also depends on where you are starting. Uh, because if you want to have a successful uh, restoration, requires tailored uh, approach that considers the, the climate, the soil type, the vegetation, and the existing challenges. And for example, if you see that the, the land is just bare, and yeah, it belongs to the communities, but it, they see it as uh, something that is not productive to them. So when you show them some of the methods that can be able to turn such a, uh, maybe if I use the word, the useless land, if they are able to turn it to something that is productive, even if it means to put up the, the initiative of like water harvesting, they are willing to take them up. And if you look at the opportunity cost, what is the opportunity cost of investing in that, in those structures, but you're not doing it, uh, you are not doing them often, or you just do them once so that you can have uh, structures that will retain water on the land. Is it better to leave the land just like that to avoid the investment or that are needed, or to uh, put up these structures that will, will ensure that the water is retained on the land and it ensures that the sustainability and increases the um, the productivity of that land? Mm -hmm. anyway. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think we need to close the panel there. Um, but before we close the panel, I, and now I might be putting you a bit on the spot, Stephen, but I want to introduce uh, uh, our uh, um, closing remarks. Uh, so, so welcome, Stephen Moretti. You're a lecturer at the Department of Land Resource Management and Agricultural Technology of the University of Nairobi. Are you there, Stephen? Yes, Thank you are. You. Hi, Stephen. Before you giving much. closing remarks, do you have a question that you feel have been unanswered or, or so that you would like to direct to someone in the panel before giving the closing remarks? Uh, I think uh, a question was asked uh, about uh, the cost benefit uh, analysis that uh, mm -hmm. Margaret has also touched on uh, of restoration. For, uh, for example, the cost of putting these uh, hard works or doing the, uh, uh, the, the hard work of uh, water harvesting uh, structures. And uh, I think uh, we have done some uh, analysis. And uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the return on investment of all uh, the restoration, for example, from a very uh, degraded uh, point uh, back to productivity in the rangeland, all the economic uh, parameters return positive. So the return on investment for restoration is positive just on economic sense. But when you also look at uh, the ecosystem services that are not valued uh, yeah. in terms of carbon, biodiversity, water, um, and, and the health of the ledge land, and moving back now, to the livelihoods of the people. Because when we restore the ledge land, that feeds directly into the livestock feed because the livelihood of the people is more uh, livestock based. And with the healthy livestock, uh, even the lives, the, the health of the people improves because they have food uh, from the livestock and also from where uh, crop production can be done. So it is positive and it is surpasses the investment. Yeah, but that has also been shown with the, the scientific data. 
Thanks for adding that, Stephen. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so with that, I will hand over to you to close this session. This is the only rangeland session at the World Water Week this uh, this year, uh, as pointed out by Melissa. So it's it's uh, it's been great to have you all here. Uh, please, uh, Stephen, go ahead and, and close the meeting. Thanks. Thanks again very much, Mali. And uh, I wish to also start with uh, thanks uh, to Siri for hosting this uh, session on the region and the whole um, uh, organization. And also the presenters for this session, Lee, Margaret, and Rubin. Thank you. And the panelists and all participants for this session. As I add, I say uh, thank you very much. And uh, I want to recap uh, just uh, um, as the uh, Lee uh, mentioned on the focus on the International Year of Legend and Pastoralists, and also the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration uh, that is giving uh, an opportunity even to focus on the legends. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the Greater Horn of Africa, uh, and also uh, the, like the Sahel uh, region, uh, much of uh, a lot, a large area of the land is uh, heavily degraded. But we have an opportunity uh, to turn this around through committing uh, to restoring these lands. And uh, from the UN SCCD, uh, uh, showing, uh, showing that uh, uh, more than 100 countries are making effort even to set their targets towards the land uh, degradation neutrality, uh, we have an opportunity uh, to uh, work and restore the degraded legends. And without focusing on the legends, the countries uh, cannot achieve uh, their commitment to uh, land degradation neutrality. So it's a call for all uh, uh, partners, governments, uh, organizations, agencies, even the NGOs, like have been shown uh, with the case of Burkina Faso, working with the communities, uh, with the researchers from the university, agencies, working with the people in Sahel or in East Africa to work towards uh, restoring the regions. And uh, we can uh, have a turnaround uh, uh, for the sake of uh, the people and also the achievement of the SGDs, like uh, number one, two, number six for water, very important, number 13 on climate action, and also life on land on number 15. So uh, my country, Kenya, for example, has committed to restoring 5.1 million hectares. Ethiopia, our neighbor, uh, have committed to 15 million. And if all uh, countries uh, work towards that, then we will uh, be able to see wh what we can achieve. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for participating in this session. Uh, back to you, Mari. Thanks so very much, Stephen, uh, for that. Uh, thanks to all our presenters. Thanks to all our panelists. And a great thank you to all our audience for all the questions and for listening in on this session. I hope that we come back with more rangeland sessions uh, in coming years in World Water Week. Hope to see you then, if not sooner. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.